if you look at this uh, CT here, the CT, and you can change the, the uh, parameters of the CT <coughs> to give you different appearances. What do you think that this is right here? What do you think that is right there? What's that bone right there? Temporal bone. What's beside the temporal bone? Temporalis muscle. Right? So that's the temporalis muscle. That's the skin. That's the fat between the skin and the uh, muscle. This person got whacked in the head. That's why that temporal, temporalis muscle is big. It's, it's swollen. It's inflamed. The hematoma on the side of the head. That hematoma produced a fracture of the temporal bone there. That fracture of the temporal bone produced this hemorrhage here. <clears throat> because it's a closed system, remember I was talking about rings the other day? If you whack a ring over here, you'll usually have a, a fracture over here. Well, it's the same thing with, with uh, contusion or trauma. If I whack something over here, that wave goes through, and when it hits the bone on the other side, it causes a similar trauma on the other side. That's what you see here. Bam. Bam. On the other side. So you have two bleeds in this person. This one over here that received the trauma is called a coup injury, and this is called a contra-coup injury. So coup, contra-coup injuries are common in closed structures like the pelvis, the head, the vertebra. That uh, explanation of top helps you there. Well, it's, uh, the way you look at uh, CTs is if you're standing at the patient's foot, feet, and looking up towards their head. So if this person is lying down, that's the patient's <coughs> left side, that's the right side. Remember, it's a slice. It's a slice. So, uh, give me a piece of paper. You come, piece of paper. No, just uh, give me your whole thing right there. So this is a slice through my head. So I can either view this slice from this way, so that my my right will be on the examiner's left. Or I can view the slice from this way, meaning the patient's right is on my right. You understand? Because you're going all the way through them. So by convention, you always view CTs as if you're standing at the patient's feet. And that way you never wind up cutting into the wrong side of a person which happened frequently when CTs first became available because there was no standard. So MRIs and CTs are always viewed as if you're standing at the patient's feet. So that's the patient's nose. That would be the left side, that would be the right side. Okay. The illusion? Okay, okay. So, here, lay that right here. Come, come up here. No, you can leave it on. <laughs> because your CTs are always done with you lying on a bed. So if I take a slice through his head right there, if I view it from down here, the right side of his head is on my left side. If I came up here and viewed that same slice from up here, the right side of his head is on my right side. That's why you <coughs> always view them from looking at the feet. Thank you, sir. Okay? Uh, here is uh, 
Here are two examples of types of hematomas. Epidural hematomas are typically arterial in nature, like the middle meningeal artery. Beneath the dura, um, and you'll see later on, there are tons of veins that are draining towards these sinuses. A subdural hematoma is typically venous. Most bleeds due to trauma of the skull are subdural in nature. An epidural hematoma, arterial, you only have a, a matter of hours to stop it, or the pressure will usually kill you. Six hours, I think, is the magic window for an epidural bleed. Subdural bleeds can drain very slowly, and um, over days, weeks, they can bleed very, very slowly. No, it doesn't drain into the sinuses. Uh, it collects without getting into the sinuses. Um, they can occur rapidly, but usually they're much slower. You know, when a little kid falls off the bed, bangs his head on the floor, you know, parents will always bring them to the emergency room, worried about whether or not they have a subdural hematoma. <coughs> well, these things can happen, like I say, slowly over time. Um, if it's an epidural, you're already going to know they have focal neurologic signs. You know, their balance is off, or they're, they're vomiting, or something like that. Uh, in a subdural hematoma, what you want to do, I mean, they might have a headache from wrapping their head on the floor. What you want to do is tell mom, take the kid home, uh, wake the kid up, go in the kid's room every hour or two, and just to see if you can arouse the kid during the night. You don't need to wake them up. Just, you know, mom, quit, or you know, they roll over and stuff like that. If they become unresponsive, they get themselves back up to the ER. But this is an overnight thing, whereas an epidural hematoma, you would know if, let me ask you a question. If there was blood in here or here, and I did a lumbar puncture, would I get a bloody return? No. No, because this is not in the subarachnoid space. It's not until you have a subarachnoid bleed will you get a bloody return on an LP. Would a concussion be part of a subdural hematoma? Uh, concussions, yeah. Usually a concussion, you know, a concussion is, there are very different levels of concussions. Most of the concussions you see in football and stuff like that, you don't have bleeds. You just have a shock to the um, nervous system. You know, if you ever watch uh, boxing or MMA, even though those guys hit a, get a direct punch and they just completely, you're knocked out. You just reset your nerve, you know, just, you shock your, you, the shock to the nervous system, the nerves just shut down and you collapse. That's more. That's that's one type of concussion on up to you know just getting hit in the head and not really knowing where you are. I remember a couple of years ago I walked outside to get the paper and there was ice on the steps, concrete steps, and I took that first step and went down and my head from a standing position hit that concrete and just bam and I just I was I went limp. I, I was conscious. I never lost consciousness. But I went limp, and I just slid down the steps. It was the goofiest feeling, because I was like a blood buddy cartoon. That's what I was thinking as I was going down the steps. I was like, what the hell? I was at the bottom of the step, and, you know, I just, I could feel the, the just the, it sounded like a crunch in my head, skull hitting that thing. I mean, that was a concussion. Uh, it took me a few minutes. I sat up, you know, I'm thinking, whew, 
I hope I don't have a huge bleed in there. And I went and got the paper and anyway. <laughs> <laughs> now when I come outside and there's any snow, ice, or potential of it, I grab hold of the brick thing here and I yeah, you do it. You grab the planter. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, it's a pressure. All right, here is an example of that sinus. The one at the top of the fault cerebri is called the superior sagittal sinus. And when you open it up, you see these little, these little uh, round things? Those are the arachnoid granulations that you see in poking into the sinus. And there are also little places where the sinus protrudes off to the side and it's full of arachnoid granulations. These are called lacunae. And you're going to see in the skull cap, when you flip it over, these arachnoid granulations can calcify. They feel like little grains of sand. They form little divots in the bone. So you'll see the uh, markings for the arachnoid granulations in the skull cap. Here's the middle meningeal artery over here on the side. Remember, it's epidural in location, right? And here are all the sinuses put together. The veins of the brain, you don't have veins uh, like you do in the rest of your body. The only real vein you have would be the internal jugular coming out. What you have up here, as far as transmitting veins or the sinuses. So the, the venous drainage from the brain, um, now there are veins brain draining the substance of the brain, but they're going towards the sinuses, not to a larger vein. So the venous drainage of the brain goes towards the superior sagittal sinus. At the bottom of the bulk cerebri, there's an inferior sagittal sinus. Blood drains backwards towards the confluence of sinuses, and in the inferior sagittal sinus meets up with the straight sinus, which is in the, fault, the tentorium cerebelli. That's the straight sinus right there. You'll see this in a lab today. The straight sinus and the superior sagittal sinus <coughs> form the confluence. From there, blood drains laterally out the transverse sinuses, through the sigmoid sinus, and out the internal jugular vein. And a couple of other sinuses here. We talked about the facial vein. It communicates through the ophthalmic veins. There's a superior and an inferior into the cavernous sinus. The cavernous sinus sits on either side of the cella cursica. There's one on each side. Obviously, you have two eyes. Blood drains from the cavernous sinus through the superior petrosal vein, uh, superior petrosal sinus, and the inferior petrosal sinus. It drains into the top and the bottom of the sigmoid sinus that I mentioned earlier. And that's how it works. It's easy to draw it out, uh, the direction of blood flow. That's the superior sinus of the sinus, inferior sinus of the sinus, straight sinus, transverse sinus, which is going to have one on each side. Sigmoid sinus, there's the internal jugular vein, facial vein, ophthalmic veins, cavernous sinus, Superior petrosal, inferior petrosal. That's it. You can see all of these in the lab. 
There are a bunch of other sinuses in here we're not going to deal with, so we're just going to leave it at that. Okay? Arterial supply of the brain, <coughs> the four vessels that we know, the two vertebral arteries, and the two internal carotid arteries. The internal carotid artery, I've already said, enters the carotid canal. There's foramina serum. That would be the membrane over the bottom of foramina serum. Once inside the skull, the vault, it forms this S shape. That S shape is called the carotid siphon. S-I-P-H-O-N. The carotid siphon. One of the first branches off of the internal carotid artery that I mentioned the other day was the ophthalmic artery, and there it is right there. It's going to join the optic nerve to go into the organ. <coughs> this illustration here is the cavernous sinus on either side. You see we've got the carotid cut in cross section here because it's cut through here. It's cut as it goes, wraps through there like that. I mentioned the other day that infection in here can impact that nerve. That nerve is the abducens nerve, which floats in the cavernous sinus. There are other cranial nerves associated with the cavernous sinus, but they are embedded in the wall of the cavernous sinus. And they're not impacted by blood clots or infection. It's only cranial nerve 6. The other nerves in the wall over here are cranial nerves 3, 4, B1, and B2. You can probably include B3 in there as well. Just say the trigeminal system. But the only one that's affected is 6. Six goes to a specific muscle called the lateral rectus, I'll mention later on. Lateral rectus rotates the eyeball laterally. So if that six is damaged, <coughs> then the medial rectus will pull it medially, because it'll be unopposed, and you'll wind up with a medially deviated eye. Somebody comes in with redness in their face here, a headache, fever, and a medially rotated eye, you better be getting on the phone with a neurosurgeon, an ophthalmologist, and the x-ray department so you can get that uh, MRI done. The arterial supply of the cortex of the brain uh, is via this structure called the arterial circle of Willis. We have our two vertebral arteries down here and our two internal carotid arteries that have been cut right here. So there are a whole bunch of branches of the arterial circle that we'll probably cover in neuroanatomy. But the ones that I want you to focus on today are, you should be able to find the vertebrals, the basilar. The basilar branches into a the right and left posterior cerebral. Let's leave it for a minute. The internal carotids come up and continue as the middle cerebral. The internal carotid branches as the posterior communicating and the anterior cerebral and then there's an anterior communicating. So it forms a circle. This is real good for you because if you have something, an embolus or a thrombus blocking something here, you can get blood to the brain by just going around the circle. And here you see the vertebrals, the basilar, posterior cerebral, posterior communicating, middle cerebral, anterior cerebral, 
and peer communicate. You'll need to find those on the page today. <coughs> One of the problems with the uh, arterial circle of Willis is they tend to form uh, aneurysms. These little round aneurysms are called berry aneurysms. Uh, if they rupture, the chance of mortality is really high, like 50%. If you identify the aneurysm, as this one has been identified on an angiogram, there are different ways to, to stop them from um, bursting. One of them is to clip them if they have a stalk like this. The other way is to do uh, to take a, a wire, go up into the arterial circle with um, interventional red lines <coughs> do this. Uh, you go up into here and you uh, put wire, little loops of wire, into the aneurysm. This is called coiling. What happens is the blood that's in the aneurysm will clot around the coil, and now you've got a clotted aneurysm and no chance of bleeding. So, uh, coiling. Commonly done. As at Baptist, there's a radiologist out there that does these things all the time. Distribution of arteries, the anterior, middle, and posterior cerebral are here. The middle cerebral artery uh, supplies the what's called the dorsal lateral surface of the brain. If you put your hand up here, that's the middle cerebral artery. The occipital uh, I mean, excuse me, the posterior cerebral supplies only the occipital lobe. <coughs> and the anterior cerebral goes up and over this large bundle here of fibers and supplies the medial side of the brain. Now, the brain is very somatotopic. Remember I said the other day that I could put my finger there and tell you what was going to happen? If a person has a, a stroke of one of these arteries, depending on their symptoms, I can tell you which artery and where that stroke is, just like Brooksy was able to do the other day. You know, the guy, was talking, the guy in the first class. The, the artery that bled on him, that he knew where it was, was right there on the left side of his brain. Okay? You knew that. Oh. You will too when we finish neuro. Any questions about that? All right, the orbit. <coughs> We're going to quickly fly through the orbit in the ear. There are a whole bunch of bones that go to <coughs> occupy, that go to form the orbit. Um, the two structures, the three structures, when you look in a bone, the skull, uh, that you see when you look in there is the op uh, optic canal, the foramen. And then here's a superior orbital fissure, and there's an inferior orbital fissure as well. <coughs> and these are formed because the greater wing of the sphenoid does not contact what's above it and what's below it. So you have these two fissures. And that's what that says. All right. That's the superior orbital fissure. It transmits uh, several uh, nerves that uh, you should you should know. It transmits V1, the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve. And don't work. Don't worry about this list right here just yet, because several of these are branches of V1. Just say that it transmits V1. It transmits cranial nerves 3, 4, and 6. 3, 4, and 6. That makes sense because 3, 4, and 6 go to the eye muscles. And it transmits the ophthalmic veins. So the ophthalmic veins get from the facial into the cavernous, cavernous sinus through the superior orbital fissure. Where does the ophthalmic artery travel? 
That's the canal, the optic canal. The ophthalmic artery does not go through the superior organ of fissure. The eye itself, uh, the outermost covering of the eye that you're looking at when you come there, is the conjunctiva. <coughs> the conjunctiva covers the outer part of the, uh, the globe and it becomes continuous onto the inner surface of the eyelids, the upper and lower eyelid. This down here is called the inferior conjunctival sac. Conjunctivitis is an infl inflammation of the conjunctiva. Conjunctivitis comes in three forms. Allergic, and if you live in Oklahoma, you probably have it. Red, itchy, watery eyes. If it's infectious, most conjunctivitis is viral, and you get it from children. They're contaminated little cougars. Mm -hmm. Anybody here have kids? We have kids. One, two, three, oh, three of them? Oh, three of them? Um, they send them to daycare, to school, and they come back with conjunctivitis. Most of the time it's viral. We also have bacterial conjunctivitis, which is uh, much more serious, um, or can be much more serious. That's why you always take conjunctivitis seriously. One, <coughs> one clinical tip, allergic conjunctivitis is always bilateral. Infectious conjunctivitis will always start from one eye and go to the other. That's kind of how you tell it apart. The, um, if we look at the eye in this view here, you flip off the, uh, the eyelids, you see these little white, whitish stripes? Those are the mabobian glands that will drain into these little holes here in the free edge of the, the, the lid. Again, as I mentioned the first day, they produce an oily substance that helps keep the eye lubricated. The different parts of the eye, uh, the globe, of course, the pupil, the iris, and this is all um, sclera, oh, excuse me, conjunctiva out here. The whitish part is also known as the sclera. The part of the sclera that covers the pupil, uh, covers the iris and the pupil, is the cornea. There is a, uh, <coughs> a um, sort of a barrier between the two. So you have the sclera, and then there's the cornea, like that. So if, that uh, if that's the iris, this barrier is called the limbus. It's on that. Uh, line right here, the limbus. When you have conjunctivitis and you look at the red injection, and when you say the word injection, it means that you see all these blood vessels. Conjunctivitis, the, the, the injected blood vessels will go up to the limbus but not cross it onto the iris or onto the cornea. We want to document that, that the injection, the scleral injection, up to, but not past the limbus. If it gets past the limbus, then it's called iritis. I-R-I-iritis. Iritis, you need to send them to an ophthalmologist. That's a medical emergency. If that, if those that injection, if the infection crosses the limbus, they need to go to an ophthalmologist. The lacrimal apparatus is up here. The lacrimal gland is up here. Tears come out, bathe the eye, and are picked up by these uh, little holes. They're called the punctum. Puncta. There's one in the lower lid, there's one on the top, <coughs> and there's a caruncle in the middle. So that thing you can, you can feel right here, that's the caruncle, that little nodule right there. If you look at each other's eyeballs, you can see that little punctum 
really easily. Tears are going to drain through the pumpkin. Here's the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve. And this is what you're going to do in the section today. You're going to take off the roof of the, or the floor of the anterior cranial fossa and look down in there. Let me tell you this, that floor is very thin. It's, uh, it doesn't take much to get through it. And I have some uh, bone pliers that will help get you through there. But what you want to do on your dissection is just open it up like this. Doesn't take long to do. Um, now the, the retroorbital area, in other words this area, is filled with fat. And you'll have to pick it out of there. But it's, uh, in, you know, don't be shy about it. Okay. Um, the, the large, uh, so this is the uh, ophthalmic division. The large nerve that you'll find here is called the frontal nerve. The frontal nerve divides into the supraorbital and supratrochlear that come out to go to the scalp. The nasociliary nerve goes off to the side here to, to supply, uh, goes through the, excuse me, I'm sorry, not the legs, nasociliary, the lacrimal nerve is found laterally. It goes through the lacrimal gland to supply the skin out here, as I mentioned before. The nasociliary nerve goes to supply the medial part, including the ethmoid sinuses, which are behind the, right through here. A lot of this, when you get sinusitis, you know, the snot and pressure, and you feel that, oh, that's painful right there. That's pain is carried by the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve. It's the nasociliary nerve doing it to you. You should be able to find those three nerves today, lacrimal, frontal, and its two branches, and the nasociliary. Also, um, you'll see the, um, the muscles in here. We'll go over the muscles in a minute. You can find the cranial nerves that go to those muscles. Cranial nerves three, four, and six. They're pretty easy to find. <coughs> uh, going back to the lacrimal apparatus, uh, this is what it looks like. Uh, tears uh, collect in the lacrimal sac, drain through the nasal bones here, and empty into the nose right here below this structure called the inferior concha. We'll talk about later. When you put your finger in your nose, the thing that it runs into is, is the inferior concha. So the lacrimal apparatus drains below the inferior concha. That's why when you're watching a sad movie and you, you have increased tears, and you know your tears are coming down, you've exceeded the ability to drain them away from your eye, so they overflow. But what also what else do you also get? You also get that little dribble of snot right here on the end of your nose, that's not snot, that's tears, because you've exceeded the ability for you to, you know, get rid of tears. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> you know, you guys are little right here. Okay. That's why, it's because it's right inside your nose. Here's the, the opening right here, there's the concha and it drains right here. You just can't, normally, I mean, fluid is coming through there at all times, but it just gets picked up by the, the cilia of the nasal mucosa and goes down, you swallow it, you don't even know it, constantly. But you start watching, you know, Forrest Gump, and Jesus Christ, I mean, just an amazing movie. <laughs> everybody, everybody think it's one of the greatest movies ever? Yeah, got some time. It was on the other night. We were down at the lake, and here I am trying to watch this thing with my wife and kid, and I'm like crying like a bitch. I mean, it's just... <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, here's something you need to appreciate here is um, we talked about um, the autonomics, you know, dilating and contracting the pupil. How do you get them there? How do you get the autonomics there? We know that the cornea is, uh, the, the sensation, if you touch it, 
is ophthalmic division of five, right? I talked about that. Um, how do you get the autonomics there? So, uh, and also the lacrimal gland. We talked about the lacrimal nerve, but the lacrimal nerve is V1. It's sensation here, but how do you innervate the lacrimal gland? So that's what I want to spend just a couple of minutes about. Here's the <coughs> trigeminal nerve here. There's the ophthalmic division. There's the lacrimal nerve of V1 going <coughs> to the area of the lacrimal gland. The lacrimal gland and the submandibular and sublingual salivary glands are innervated by cranial nerve 7. facial nerve. Remember the facial nerve is parasympathetic? Had one of those boxes around it. So those preganglionic parasympathetic fibers come out of the brain stem right there. That's in blue. Those preganglionic, now it's a visceral efferent, so it's got to find a ganglia, right? The two ganglia associated with seven that are going to feed the lacrimal gland and the two salivary glands are the first one is called the perigopalatine ganglia. It's right there. So the preganglionic synapse in the <coughs> The postganglionic leave there and travel on the lacrimal nerve to reach the gang to reach the gland. So if we look at this structure here, there's the lacrimal nerve right there. Seven is depicted here. There's the pterygopalatine ganglia. It actually hangs off of V2. <coughs> so seven would synapse in there, and it continue on traveling with V2, then it hops over onto V1 to go to the gland. So 7 is using the trigeminal to get to the target. That's another one of those examples of one nerve using the other. The innervation of the lacrimal gland is 7. The, the innervation of the skin around the lacrimal gland area is 5. Now there's another place here that seven comes out, the preganglionic, and hanging off of the lingual nerve in the oral cavity is a, gland, is a ganglion called the submandibular ganglion. They synapse there, and then they'll just catch a ride on a blood vessel over to the submandibular and sublingual salivary glands. So the pterygopalatine ganglion is the site of the postganglionic cell body, parasympathetic, to go to the lacrimal gland. Hangs off of V2. Submandibular ganglion hangs off of the lingual of V3 and is the same site for those nerves that are going to the two salivary glands to the, to the floor of the mouth. Interesting thing, I'll just I'll tell you, that, um, you know, we talked about Bell's palsy. Bell's palsy, causing the facial droop. You got that? You got that? Got that down? Well, it can also affect the autonomics here. And when Bell's, when you get over Bell's palsy, and these nerves actually have to regrow, they have, and these have to reconnect, sometimes they can connect backwards. So what was originally intended to go to the lacrimal gland now goes to the salivary glands, or to the ganglia. What was originally intended to go here went to the salivary, went to the lacrimal gland. So when you are watching Forrest Gump, 
You don't cry, you salivate. And when you go to the ranch steakhouse to get their 10 ounce filet, <laughs> you don't salivate, you cry. <laughs> That's known as crocodile tears. A crocodile, when it eats, it tears. They're false tears. If somebody is, you know, if I tell you, you know, if you come in and you say, oh, you know, I made an app on the anatomy test. Oh, uh, you know, I'm so, oh my gosh, you know, I'm so sad. Well, you made an app on the anatomy exam because the night before you were drunk. And I saw you down at breakdown. You didn't study. You're hearing all the tears are screaming down your face. BS. Those are not real tears. <laughs> those are <coughs> crocodile tears. You remember that expression? You look at those false tears. And it can happen in Bell's palsy with that uh, screw up in the rewiring. Remember, I mentioned uh, Dr. Cox, Doug Cox, the representative from Grove that carried our bill. His wife was a nurse with uh, Bell's palsy, and when she healed up, that's, this is one of her problems. Uh, she has crocodile tears. All right. Um, the uh, <coughs> one thing I want to mention here is uh, it says the corneal reflex involves three uh, nerves. So if I look this way and I touch the cornea, I'm testing what nerve? I'm testing what? What nerve provides sensation to the cornea? Right. More specifically, not the trigeminal, but D1. Yeah. Right? So when I do that, I blink. What nerve, I mean, what muscle closes the eye? You dissected it yesterday. What muscle goes around the eye? Your orbicularis oculi. What innervates that? What is that? That's facial expression. So you're, so I tested five, I closed my eyes, that's seven, and you're going to find in just a second, the muscle that opens your eye is innervated by three. So by doing the blink, blink reflex, you're just testing cranial nerve V1, V7, and three. There are a couple of things here regarding um, the, uh, the, uh, the pupil. We know about the dilation and constriction of the pupil, right? If we look at the iris here and do a cross-section of the iris, it contains two types of muscles, uh, circular muscles and radial muscles. If the radial muscles contract, it's going to dilate. It's called the dilator pupillae muscle. If the circular muscles contract, it will cause the pupil to constrict, right? That's called the sphincter pupillae. The dilator, we know, is innervated by the sympathetics. The sphincter, we know, is innervated by the parasympathetics. Here's the, uh, here are the muscles right here in the um, <coughs> iris. These would be the circular. These are the dilators here. And this is how you get the innervation here. Cranial nerve 3 is the oculomotor nerve. It has two functions. One is it controls eye movement. The other is the parasympathetics. <coughs> Remember the three have the left around it. It enters the orbit through the superior orbital fissure, because I said it does. It synapses in a ganglion that hangs off of the, um, actually hangs off the nasociliary nerve. The nasociliary is part of V1, right? Nasociliary, frontal, and lacrimal. That little ganglion is called the ciliary ganglion. And then the postganglionic go over to the sphincter pupillae muscle.
the sympathetics get there. Oh, by the way, this is a thing you should have, should pick up on. If the ciliary ganglion hangs off of V1, the pterygopalatine ganglion hangs off of V2, the submandibular ganglion hangs off of V3. Ha! Huh, amazing how that worked out. Okay? Just things like that fascinate anatomists. You don't need to get excited about it. All right, the way you get sympathetics to the area, later on tonight, you're going to wake up tonight and you say, oh, that is kind of cool. Um, the sympathetic, how do you get the sympathetics to the eye? Remember, they start, and I drew it out for you on the board the other day, remember? The preganglionics are at T1. They enter the chain, they don't synapse, they go up to the cervical, superior cervical chain ganglion, where they synapse. They'll catch a ride on the internal carotid. It gets into the, it gets into the inside of the <coughs> skull. The first branch off the internal carotid, the ophthalmic, takes it right to the eye. And that's what it's showing here. A plexus around the internal carotid there at the carotid siphon, and it just hops over and goes to the eye. Where's the postganglionic? It was down here. For the sympathetic, this is the chain ganglia, cervical chain ganglia. Where's the post ganglion to the parasympathetic? It's up here. Uh, there's another structure in the eye that you need to be aware of it's called the ciliary body. That's what this thing is right here. The ciliary body contains <coughs> muscles um, that. Um, have these little fibers that come off of them that attach to the capsule of the lens. So if I'm looking at that clock back there, I want my lens to be flat. If I'm looking far away, it needs to be flat. But as an object gets closer, in order to keep it in focus, you have to increase the thickness of the lens. And the way you do that here is with this cili ciliary body. It contracts or relaxes, which contracts or relaxes these fibers. These are called zonula fibers. And the lens has an automatic, if you take the tension off the fibers, the lens will turn biconcave, biconvex. It'll be rounded. If you relax the fibers, the lens will uh, become rounded. So if I'm looking at a close object, my fibers are relaxed and my lens is rounded. In order to relax the fibers, what I have to do is actually contract the ciliary body. Think of it as the ciliary body goes around the eye like that coming off of there and attached to the <coughs> iris is here. If I were to relax the fibers, then I contract the muscle and make the hole smaller, which relaxes the fibers. Okay? It's kind of opposite to what you would think. You would think that if you contracted the muscle, it would tighten the fibers. It's completely backwards. If you contract the muscle, you loosen the fibers. All right, so, here's the thing. <laughs> and when you relax, that's when you relax, that's when you are looking far, when your lens is flat. I will give you an example. Okay. okay. So, I'm looking at the clock. Well, I'm looking at this thing right here. And then all of a sudden, I'm bringing it towards the, me like this. So, I have to do a couple of things. One is, in order to track it coming towards me, I have to rotate my eyes inward. That's cranial nerve three, as you'll see in a minute. That goes to the medial rectus muscle to rotate your eye in. I also have to fatten my lens. And by doing that, what I have to do is contract my ciliary muscle to relax the fibers so it allows the lens to get rounded. So that component is autonomic of three. Innervation of the ciliary body <coughs> is 
Well, let me back up. Innervation of the ciliary body is somatic. What I also have to do is as I get closer, I have to dilate my pupil. No, excuse me, I have to constrict my pupil as I get closer. So there are three things that happen. One is your eyes rotate inward. Two, the lens gets fatter. And three, the pupil gets smaller. Rotating my eye inwards, fattening the pupil, or a somatic of three, making my eyeball small, my pupil smaller, is autonomic of three. That test is called accommodation and convergence. Convergence is when your eyes converge on that point as it moves forward. Accommodation involves the lens and the pupil. So that's part of the physical exam. You, you see, you always see, if you look at my, hold your head still, look at my finger here. You do this right here, you do that. You're testing the extraocular eye movement muscles, and then they always do that. When they do that, they're testing accommodation and convergence. Uh, in this example right here, it just gives you an example of these zonular fibers coming off the ciliary body. Cranial nerve 2 um, is the optic nerve. This is a fundoscopic exam right here. This is showing where the optic nerve is entering the back of the globe. And once it enters there, well actually what happens is the retinal fibers are entering to form the optic nerve. There are no um, rods or cones. Everybody knows what a rod and a cone is. There are no rods or cones here. That is your blind spot. You can find your blind spot. Actually, uh, if, you, if you look around, you can <coughs> find your blind spot. Okay? The place where there's the highest density of cones, which detect detail and color, is out here, that darkened area, that's called your macula densa. When you look at something, you're turning your macula densa to that object to get the maximum. When you're in low light situations, what you do, you always, what do you do when you're in low light? So you turn your head and you turn your eyes to try to optimize the macula densa looking at the object. We talked earlier about increased intracranial pressure. You see the branches of the, this is called the central artery of the retina. In increased intracranial pressure, the disc pushes into the retina. So the arteries, they come in and they have to step off of the, the protruding disc, and that's what they, these look, see, they're at the same level. They're just rolling off of there like that. In uh, increased intracranial pressure on a fundoscopic exam, they look like there's a, a step off. Very apparent. The optic nerves come back to meet to form the optic chiasm. Behind the optic chiasm are the optic tracts. This is the way your visual system is set up. I think I'm not going to go over this. Let's, yeah, let's go over it real quick. The retina is divided into temporal and nasal retina. So remember, if the retina is here, light comes in and just goes straight across. It doesn't bend. So my nasal retina sees 
the temporal visual field. So in other words, if I'm, say, looking out here, um, that image is coming into my nasal retina. Nasal retinal fibers cross in the optic chiasm to go to the other side. Temporal retinal fibers stay on the same side. So if you stop and think about it a minute, this side is seeing the opposite visual field. This side is seeing the opposite visual field. So if I cut the optic nerve, you're just going to be blind in that eye. That's not hard to figure out. <laughs> if I cut the optic chiasm in this direction, like that, what you lose are the crossing fibers, which means you can't see, let me click on through here, which means you can't see either temporal fields. That's called bitemporal, meaning both temporals, hemi, meaning half, and, meaning without, opia, meaning vision, bitemporal, hemi and opia. If I cut the optic tract, I lose the ipsilateral, ipsi is same side, contralateral is the opposite side. I lose the ipsilateral temporal retina and the contralateral nasal retina, which sees the opposite visual field. So if I cut here, I lose both sides over here. So if I were to cut my right optic tract, I couldn't see over there. If you cut the right optic tract, that's called left homonymous, meaning the same side, hemianopia. If you cut the, the left optic tract, you'll have right homonymous hemianopia. Okay, I think we'll stop there and we'll pick it up. Uh, no, let me give a couple more minutes. I gotta have a couple more minutes. Let's talk about the uh, muscles, and then we'll go to lab, and then we'll deal with the, deal with the ear later. Um, there are six muscles inside the the orbital system here. Um, there are four recti and two oblique muscles. There's a superior rectus, an inferior rectus, a lateral rectus and a medial rectus. And then there are two obliques that come in from the side. The, the only two, uh, here's another view here, the recti, the obliques there, here's the superior rectus, Above the superior rectus is this muscle here, <coughs> it's cut. That is called the levator palpebrae superioris. That raises your upper eyelid. That's innervated by three. So when we did the pupillary uh, reflex, the corneal reflex, pain is five, V1, close your eye is uh, five, excuse me, seven, you open your eye is three. That's the muscle that opens your eye. The Vader palpebrae superioris. When you look at uh, the function of the these muscles, um, there's a, there are only two pure directions. The lateral rectus takes the eyeball laterally. The medial rectus takes it medially. Any other movement requires a combination of those muscles.